and I am the architectural rep here in Florida. Um, I do cover the Southeast, so if you are located in Georgia, any of the Carolinas, Virginia, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, um, I will be your architectural rep for those states as well. Um, a little bit about me, I've been in the industry for a little over eight years and with the company for about a year and a half. And um, we'll go ahead and get started with this presentation. So, like Isaac said, we'll be talking about blindside waterproofing today. So, let's go ahead and get started. So, first, I'd like to start by telling you who we are as a company. Uh, WR Meadows is family owned and operated since 1926 out of Elgin, Illinois. If you're not familiar with Elgin, it's about 45 minutes out from Chicago. We continued growth throughout North America with 13 facilities and three of those being in Canada. If you take a look at the map here, this will give you an idea of our manufacturing and warehouse facility locations. Um, as I said before, I'm located in Orlando, so conveniently I do have a warehouse here in Orlando. And then about eight hours north in Cartersville, Georgia, we have a manufacturing facility. So this is a really good way to kind of get an idea of what your lead times are looking like with our, with our company. In the Meadows family of products, uh, we are known for building envelopes that will include your below grade, above grade waterproofing, which is a lot of the items that we're going to discuss today, as well as your air barriers. Um, we're also known for our expansion joint materials, concrete restoration, joint sealants. We are also in ownership with Blue Ridge Fiber Board, which is known for soundproofing and insulation board. Um, they are also known for your cover board for single ply roofing systems. We just recently acquired a company called Gemite Products. Gemite's going to be all of your cementitious waterproofing. Uh, these are the kind of items that you're going to see in like your sewage systems or your water treatment facility plants. Um, we also have Deco Seal, which is going to be all of our pool applications. So these are going to be deck coatings and sealants for pool decks, as well as all the accessories involved. As Isaac discussed, this is AIA HSW accredited. Um, and you should be receiving your certificate within a week or so to the emails that you guys provided. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, some of the things that we're going to be discussing today is understanding the fundamentals of why below grade waterproofing is essential and the type of waterproofing that's available to you. We want to examine blindside and under slab waterproofing, as well as explore when to use blindside waterproofing as a waterproofing solution. We would like to analyze the materials used in a blindside waterproofing membrane and review the reasons why surface preparation is so important. We will also be reviewing the basic practices of installation techniques of a blindside waterproofing system. So now we're going to go over blindside waterproofing versus, versus traditional. Blindside waterproofing is a newer approach to below grade waterproofing on job sites where traditional waterproofing is not possible. Traditional waterproofing, which can also be called open cut, is where a foundation wall is poured and concrete is given ample time to cure prior to waterproofing with post applied products or what we call a pre applied system. Blindside is where a soil retention system is required to keep the soil out of the below grade excavation. And this could be with the use of wood lagging, piece and walls, shock, shockcrete walls, or secant walls, and et cetera. We install waterproofing onto the soil retention system, and then we pour the foundation wall up against the blindside waterproofing membrane. Blindside systems are used on a job site where the foundation is often below the water table or under a great deal of hydrostatic pressure. So the height, weight, and density of water pressing up against the structure, the greater the height, weight, and density, the greater the pressure. And in wa and water in liquid form will always be looking for a crack or an area that is not detailed correctly to leak its way in. Blindside waterproofing is also a solution for zero lot lines and sites with limited access to the outer portion of the walls being built. So it's important to understand which materials and techniques to use in blindside waterproofing applications to ensure a long lasting waterproofing system. There are a number of ways to go about waterproofing a structure as mentioned earlier. Traditional where we can access the outside or positive side of the structure to waterproof it traditionally. Negative side waterproofing, which is typically for addressing antiquated structures without a positive side system or without access to the positive side. Or interval where we add crystalline waterproofing to the mix and then supplement with both positive and negative side waterproofing systems as needed to detail it. 
All of these systems we will discuss in greater detail further in the presentation. But the fundamental question to ask is this. Why is below grade waterproofing so essential? Moisture is your answer. Moisture is the reason why there are so many different types of waterproofing products on the market today. Excessive moisture can cause significant damage to the foundation wall or lower level interior spaces. When the below grade portion of a building is not properly addressed with a waterproofing system, negative effects will take place quickly. Negative effects can be addressed by interior waterproofing, which does not solve the external damage or water pressure negatively affecting the wall and floor substrates. Sometimes, installing an external drain, which can consist of leaping tiles or a system that pumps water away from the structure, or grading soil away from the building can help, but these are not always options depending on the building location. If you ask any manufacturer, it's always best to waterproof on the positive side of the below-grade below structure or the wet side of the wall, basically the side where the water is coming from. The whole idea is to just prevent it from happening in the first place. So why waterproof our structure? Why is it necessary? Capillary action is the reason. Capillary action is the ability of liquid to flow in narrow spaces without the assistance of, or even in opposition to, external forces like gravity. Concrete is extremely porous, and it acts as a sponge and reservoir to absorb liquid water and move liquid water into the interior. If the structure is unprotected, liquid water can also move through cracks that unexpectedly occur in the concrete over time. Rainwater, irrigation runoff, drainage from surrounding sites, flowing groundwater, and the water table are all sources of liquid water that we need to consider and address during design. In addition, the height of the water table can change during the year. While it depends on climate, the water table is typically at its highest in the spring and the lowest in the fall. Moisture can enter the structure through both the vertical structural wall and the horizontal structural tab, slab. Anticipating where water is coming from, where it will go, and how much water is expected will influence the design and the protection level of the waterproofing system. So why do we care if liquid water enters our structure? If the building envelope is exposed to liquid water, over time, erosion of the concrete and corrosion of the rebar can occur. In northern climates, we are also concerned with the freeze-thaw damage. Freeze-thaw damage is when water absorbed by the concrete freezes and creates pressure in the pores of the concrete. It can create cracking, scaling, and crumbling of the concrete. When this process is repeated, it can cause significant structural damage. An unprotected structure may allow for liquid water to enter the interior occupied space. Unwanted moisture in the interior can lead to health concerns like mold or mildew. And in addition, if the liquid water is flowing into the interior space, it becomes uninhabitable for the occupants. So how do we address these issues? In the dense urban environments, we are usually where usually blindside waterproofing systems are typically being called for. Buildings have more floors below grade than ever before, which makes waterproofing difficult. In urban areas where buildings are located close together, the urban structures can have multi-level parking garages, meeting spaces below grade, finished basements below grade and homes, and many of our structures accommodate living and habitable space below grade. So the deeper the foundation, the higher the chance for water damage. The water protection system needs to happen on the outside or what we call the positive side. But in an urban environment, that becomes difficult because of the zero lot lines. Effective waterproofing will accomplish three main objectives. And here's what they are. Number one, withstand hydrostatic pressure. Number two, bridge cracks that occur naturally in the concrete. Number three, prevent water vapor from entering the walls and the floor. Hydrostatic pressure is the constant force of water pressure against the below grade foundation walls from the standing or moving water. Water weighs 60 pounds per cubic foot, and during heavy rains, the ground can become completely saturated with it. So imagine thousands of pounds of pressure pushing against the wall constantly. A high, a high water table will create great amount of height, weight, and density of water pressing up against the foundation wall, creating a strong hydrostatic pressure. So even a well-constructed foundation wall can suffer water damage under those conditions. We're going to address water vapor thoroughly in our next slide. What we understand about vapor 
is that it will naturally move from an area of high vapor pressure to an area of low vapor pressure in the soil, independent of air pressure and based on the difference in temperature and relative humidity. So the temperature of the earth below grade is 55 degrees at all times. And the relative humidity underground, what would that be? 100% relative humidity at all times. So if we know that vapor moves independent of air pressure and based on the difference in relative humidity and temperature, we can assume that many times of the year without a vapor barrier, we will have a natural vapor drive from the soil through the concrete into our structures. And because we know concrete is not a good vapor barrier because it's inherently permeable and porous, the water control system of the building goes beyond the membrane. So water control should be addressed on all six sides of the building and below, above and below grade. What is done above grade contributes to the effectiveness of our below grade system. We also have to deal with deflection. Deflection is the first line of defense. Deflecting as much water as possible away from the building as quickly as possible will lower the load that the water protection systems have to withstand. This can be done through the use of overhangs, eaves, gutters, and sloping the soil away from the building. The cladding will also help deflect the water away from the structural component. Number two, we have to deal with protection. There will be significant water that isn't deflected. Therefore, the structure must be further protected. Above grade, the water protection system includes the cladding and a water resistant air barrier. Below grade, the water protection system may include damp proofing or more commonly a true waterproofing membrane. And lastly, drainage. We must prevent the buildup of hydrostatic pressure. Drainage is required to move liquid water down the exterior of the building and away from the foundation. The longer the foundation is exposed to hydrostatic pressure, the more opportunity those membranes have to fail. The drainage system includes drainage mats or drainage boards, both above and below grade, which will move the water down the base of the structure, and the draining boards then tie into a French drain or other foundational drainage systems to move the water away from the structure. So when choosing a waterproofing system, there's three different types that we need to consider. One, the positive side, two, negative side, and three, the integral waterproofing. Positive side systems place the protective membrane on the most exterior side of the structural wall, or what we call the wet side of the wall. Negative side systems place the waterproofing membrane on the interior side of the structural wall, or what we call the dry side. Integral waterproofing systems incorporate the waterproofing mechanism inside the concrete mix itself. No matter which system is used, all of them have common characteristics that make them effective in protecting the structure. So the primary characteristic of waterproofing is resistance to hydrostatic pressure, as we discussed earlier. If the material is not resistant to hydrostatic pressure, then by definition, it is not a true waterproofing system. A product that is resistant to water, but not under hydrostatic pressure is characterized as a damp proofing material. Damp proofing is only acceptable by code in very dry climates or where no hydrostatic pressure or buildup of liquid water is anticipated. Always verify with your local code requirements to see if damp proofing is appropriate for the location. Most commercial applications will require a true waterproofing system. No matter how robust the system is, if there is damage to the membrane, an untreated penetration, or an open seam, water will exploit the weak point. The membrane must be continuous and all weak points must be treated accordingly. In addition, these membranes must withstand the, the typical job site stress and environmental exposure, specifically UV exposure. By covering the waterproofing system quickly, the less exposure and abuse they will receive. Prevention is easier than patching. So a strong, flexible membrane won't damage it easily and less will, be, will have to be repaired. In addition, waterproofing is not a maintenance friendly system. So once the concrete is poured or the soil is backfilled, it is very difficult to access the positive side of these systems for repair. If damage occurs during the backfill or the concrete pour, expensive remedial waterproofing may be necessary. Also, these membranes must last the entire life of the building and not degrade over time. So the waterproofing membrane must be able to accommodate movement. Soil will sift over time and concrete will crack. So the system must be able to protect the structure even after this movement occurs. So now we're gonna talk about the positive side of waterproofing. So this occurs on the outside or the same side as the water source, what we call again, the wet side. It is most often used in new construction, 
and it is considered the best option when possible because it protects the structure from potential water damage before the water even has a chance to penetrate. Positive side provides its brief thaw protection and protects the concrete against corrosive elements in the groundwater and soil contaminants. Corrosive elements in the groundwater can consist of bicarbonate, calcium, magnesium, nitrate, sodium, and phosphate in abnormal levels, which a soil report can determine. Chemical concentrations can also depend on where the structure is located. So in industrial, agriculture, and waste disposal can leave toxic chemicals in the water that cannot be filtered out naturally in the ground. Full protection against corrosive elements in the groundwater depends on the material and the chemicals present. So a phase two soil report can assist in picking materials up to the task of resisting these chemicals. Positive side waterproofing disadvantages. If repairs are needed, the process is difficult and expensive. So during construction, positive side waterproofing relies on extra attention from the project team. This will include the general contractor, waterproofer, third party inspector, and the manufacturer. Negative side waterproofing refers to placing the waterproofing membrane in the interior side of the wall or what we call the dry side. This method is typically used if there is no access to the external or positive side of the wall. So if for an example, you have existing construction with elevator pits or remedial waterproofing, and due to a failure in this new construction, negative side waterproofing is easier to patch or correct if an issue arises. However, it is limited in what it actually protects. So negative side waterproofing prevents liquid water from entering an occupied space, but it does not protect the structure. Liquid water and soil contaminants like sulfates, oil, salts, calcium hydroxide, they can still penetrate the structure, which can erode the concrete and potentially corrode the structural steel. In addition, negative side waterproofing does not protect against free stall damage. So down south, like here in Florida, you know, free stall is not much of a concern, but in the northern climate, it can cause serious damage. Free stall refers to the process of water saturating small cracks in the concrete, and then as it freezes, the water expands and turns small cracks into slightly larger cracks. The ice melts and the process begins again until once the insignificant cracks become a serious structural issue. Integral waterproofing essentially turns the concrete itself into a water barrier. So standard concrete is very porous. So by adding a crystalline admixture, a reaction to the free line creates more crystallization than standard concrete, which fills up the pores. Unfortunately, when the concrete cracks, so does the waterproofing. Some crystalline material can self-seal very small cracks because water will jumpstart the chemical reaction to make calcium silicate hydrate, or CSH crystals again, which is the foundational compound formed in the concrete. If the cracks are larger, then remedial waterproofing may be necessary. Additionally, surface penetrations and openings in the envelope are not addressed with integral waterproofing. It will have to be carefully detailed. Both blindside and traditional waterproofing fall under the positive side waterproofing category. In both cases, the waterproofing is on the most exterior side of the substrate. In a completed foundational wall, each material ends up in the same order, drainage board, waterproofing membrane, and then structural wall. But the order of installation is different. In a traditional waterproofing, the site is over excavated, the foundational and structural concrete is poured, the concrete wall is pure, and then waterproofing membrane is applied to the structural concrete. Traditional waterproofing is also referred to as post-applied waterproofing. In a blend site application, the site is excavated only to the footprint of the structure. A soil retention system is installed, and then a drainage board of protection course is applied directly against the soil retention system. The waterproofing membrane is attached to the protection course, the rebar is placed, and finally, the concrete is poured against the waterproofing membrane. Blindside waterproofing is also referred to as pre-applied waterproofing or open-cut waterproofing. The blindside waterproofing method has been around for a very long time in various forms, since the early 1900s. Its rise in popularity is due primarily to the rapid growth of urban environments. Frequently, surface parking lots or small on-grade structures are developed into high-rise office towers with existing structures but on multiple sides. The new structure may call for several floors of below-grade parking, but over excavation is impossible. So the construction of the new structure must be contained within the law lines, therefore the blind side is the only option. In addition, any situation where over excavation is impossible or cost prohibitive, 
may require a blindside installation, like construction on a hill or bedrock, construction inside the water table, or construction in sensitive ecosystems or brownfield site. According to the manual of the low grade waterproofing systems by Justin Herschel, there are six criteria to evaluate a site's waterproofing needs. As buildings are constructed closer together and with stricter code requirements, site access can be considered a seventh criteria. Once positive site waterproofing is selected as the best option, restricted, restricted sites may, may access cause blindside waterproofing to only be the solution to protect against the water infiltration. The other criteria we need to consider is your soil condition, hydrostatic pressure, water table, substrate stability, building occupancy, construction method, and of course, site access as discussed. When reviewing the final installation of an over excavated site and a blind site application, the components of the waterproofing systems actually end up in the same place. The drainage board or protection course is the most exterior, then the waterproofing membrane is installed, then the structural concrete. However, the blindside installation of these components occur in reverse order compared to a traditional waterproofing application. In a traditional application, the site is cleared first, the walls are poured, then the waterproofing and drainage plane is installed against the foundational wall. After the waterproof waterproofing system is installed, the site is backfilled. And if, in a blindside application, a soil retention or supportive excavation is installed first and held in place by tie valves. Then the drainage board or protection course is installed, followed by the waterproofing membrane, and then finally the rebar is placed and the structural concrete is poured. There are many commonly used soil retention systems, including wood lagging, sheet piling, boulder piling, slurry, and shotcrete. But the most important thing, no matter what system you use, is that the soil retention system is smooth and continuous. Another thing to remember about these soil retention systems is that they are designed to be temporary. They are designed to hold up the drainage board and to hold up the waterproofing membrane until the concrete is poured. Once it is poured, the ultimate goal is that those membranes bond with the concrete and the retention system. It is going to shift over time, but I know that does not happen, doesn't always happen. There's a lot of different variations based on soil condition. But one term for this application is called a bathtub. We are bathtubbing the site because we are waterproofing both the base and the horizontal and the vertical. Surface preparation of the soil retention system. It must be smooth and continuous. All gaps in the soil retention need to be filled. And if they are larger than two inches, they will also definitely need to be filled and prepped in a different way. This is because uh, this can be with plywood or concrete. Sometimes it can be foam, but we're not a huge fan of foam because when that concrete is poured, it's going to push out this more flexible membrane into the voids and create protrusions. So as the soil retention system degrades or shifts, those protrusions become more vulnerable. Drainage boards help over the smaller gaps so we don't have to fill in every little space in between the plywood because the drainage board is going to create a smooth surface most of the time. If you're using a slurry or shotcrete, you must grind down any sharp points for that same exact reason. When the concrete is poured, it is going to push the membrane hard against the soil retention system. And if there are any sharp points, they can potentially puncture the membrane. And at that point, we don't know where the membrane is punctured. And we won't know there's an issue until we have water going into our building. So if you're using shot crease slurry, make sure it's as smooth as possible. Now with drainage systems, there's, we, they actually act as two things. We want water to go down the drainage system as quickly as possible, and we want to move that water away from our membrane and prevent any buildup of hydrostatic pressure. Now, these drainage boards are usually composite boards, and they're made up of a couple different materials, including a soil filter fabric that will keep the soil out of the drainage board so that it doesn't clog. And it also has this very specific profile for the water to flow through. So it's free flowing all the way through the base, and then it will tie into whatever drainage system is around the foundation. That could be a pump, a French drain, or any other design drainage system. And there are different size drainage systems for different applications. If we were only going one story below grade, we're not going to need as much flow capacity as if we were going three or four stories below grade because of the opportunity for water to build up is greater in the deeper that we go into the earth. Now, if you're building inside the water table, 
then your drainage mat actually isn't going to do much in terms of drainage. It might still protect the membrane against shifting soil as the soil retention system degrades. But if we're sitting in the water table, we're still going to get that hydrostatic pressure. So we may need to use a different type of protection course if we're going to, like if we're going to be using bentonite for an example. And we haven't talked about bentonite yet, but you'll find out shortly that those products actually need hydration to work effectively. So we don't want to prevent water from getting to those types of systems because it's part of the system characteristics that make it work. Sheet applied are typically made out of some sort of bituminous material, like a polymer modified asphalt. And then they're put in some sort of laminated plastic facer that will help with the durability, like an HDPE PVC or a butyl rubber TPO. There's so many different types of products out there that will help make them more durable. And depending on the manufacturer, they also have a ton of proprietary materials that are involved in these sheet materials, such as geotextile adhesives. A little more on sheet waterproofing, there are two different ways to do this. You can either do a mechanical bond where a geotextile becomes physically embedded into the concrete to create a mechanical bond, or there are products out there that have a chemical adhesion, kind of like an adhesive, that will bond to the concrete. They do require skilled labor to install, but, it would, but I would argue that all blind side membranes require skilled labor and proper detailing of the seams because it's the weak point at the overlap on the seam that are most troublesome. One of the benefits is that it's a uniform thickness. So we're not depending on the applicator to make sure that there is enough membrane there to do its job correctly. There are many options for this install as well. Seams are the weak points and of these sheet membranes, so we need to make sure that they are all protected and sealed to keep water out. There are different ways of doing that. Some systems require a tape, and that tape is rolled to create a very strong bond. You can also heat fuse, which is where we're essentially melting the two together to create one membrane. And then there are self-sealing factory edges. This is where there, there is adhesive on the factory edge during the overlap, and all of those seams need to be rolled. However, if you're building in the water table, then we're going to have to do the seams a little bit differently. Heat fusing is acceptable if we are building in the water table because it's probably the best watertight seal. But if heat fusing is not an option, we will reinforce the seams with a liquid membrane and reinforce fabric embedded into the liquid membrane within inches on either side of the seams. These are the weak points that we need to ensure that no liquid water is getting in, going to move past this membrane. So in the water table, heat fusing and embedded fabric reinforcement are the two best options. We've been talking a lot about vertical plane when we mentioned a bathtub, but those seams can be very tricky when it comes to moving from vertical to horizontal. The way that we deal with that is by making the angle a little less steep so that it flows a little bit easier. We can use a liquid component, tapes, or flexible sheets to make that angle a little bit easier and to not put too much pressure on the membrane. But we do need to reinforce that area because that's going to be one of those weak points that we have to watch out for. With fluid applied membranes, we're, we're hanging geotextile fabric we're attaching it to the drainage board, and then we are spraying an asphaltic emulsion on top of the geotextile to saturate it. This creates a durable seamless membrane. This is a little more dependent on applicator ability because we need to make sure that the thickness is correct and that all of the fabric is saturated correctly. But the benefit of not having seams is a reason why many people choose this type of membrane. Bonding with this adhesion or the mechanical bond is completely different than how the fluid applied membranes bond to the concrete after the concrete is poured. It starts the curing process and that concrete cure actually generates heat that will soften the surface of the emulsion liquid. It will re-liquefy essentially and then attach itself to the concrete. Now we're gonna get into betonite, which we mentioned earlier. So betonite is a naturally occurring product. It is a clay that has the potential to swell up times its size, and it absorbs water, and as it's hydrated, the betonite is actually an incredibly effective waterproofing product, but it relies on compression and hydration. So as the betonite absorbs water, it turns into this waterproofing gel. As long as it remains under compression, it will protect our structure from additional water because it will absorb all of the water. Now, unfortunately, betonite is not a vapor-proof material on its own, and it's not a very structured material. So as it turns into a gel, it loses its structure. Betonite is, is usually going to be combined with an asphaltic facing 
and in between a lot of layers of geotextiles. So as the bentonite expands, the geotextile fabric will hold it in place. And as the soil shifts, it will keep it together in order to keep our structures protected. Bentonite systems are not fully adhered systems because they're not going to bond to the concrete. And they're just going to exist outside the concrete under compression with constant hydration. That's how they work. Now, bentonite is best used in areas where it has constant hydration. So either in the water table or very high water tables is where we can expect a lot of ground or soil saturation. What we don't want to do with our membranes is put it in an application where there are a lot of wet, dry cycles. Because bentonite is most effective when it is fully hydrated. If we have a long dry spell, the clay actually starts to dry out and then it will start to crack. And then the crack, uh, it will then move within its constraints. And then when we have another rain event, it will rehydrate it. Um, it takes some time for the bentonite clay to become rehydrated. And at that point, our structure is vulnerable as water can move through the clay until it's at its full capacity. If you're expecting a lot of rain in the next couple of weeks, or you do not have enough time, or you're not ready to pour your concrete just yet, we recommend that you just hold off because the bentonite clay gets wet, and then it can start to swell before it's under that compression state. And then we lose a lot of the strength in the system. Essentially, we just need to replace it with some dry bentonite at that point. So we would need to be very, very careful not to get these membranes wet before they're supposed to be wet. Fasteners are very important. Always follow the manufacturer's instructions and do not skip on fasteners. We need to make sure that these membranes are going to remain vertical during the concrete pour and that the weight of the concrete is not going to pull the membrane down. That can create wrinkles, which aren't that great, but we can deal with them. If it pulls it even further down and we have a huge section of the wall that, that is unprotected, we'll have to take that concrete out, re-waterproof and repair it, and it's very expensive to correct. So make sure that the correct fasteners are being used and make sure that they are sealed. Detailing penetrations, and we're talking vertical pipe penetrations. The hardest part about dealing with these types of membranes is catching all the penetrations. We can use a liquid membrane or mastic with a piece of the membrane and then install the sheet membrane on top of it. Then we have tiebacks. Two ways of dealing with tiebacks, you can completely cover it in a liquid membrane. Another option is we can build up a cover for the tiebag using different materials. Then we will cover it in a liquid membrane embedded in a reinforcing fabric into the liquid membrane. And then we can smoothly place the waterproofing membrane over the whole section. After the membrane installation, I would argue that this is the most important part is to inspect the membrane immediately prior to the pour after the rebar is installed. Because once that concrete is poured, if there's any defects or damage that we didn't catch, we're not gonna know about it until we have an issue at that point. And it's very expensive. So please take your time during the inspections and observations. We need to make sure that we patch every single piece of damage or defect if it is small or fairly easy. So half an inch or less, we would just paint over it with some liquid membrane or mastic. A half inch to one inch, we're going to embed fabric into that liquid membrane just to give it a little bit more strength and durability. Anything over an inch is a little cumbersome to repair, especially after the rebar has been installed. But it's very important that one inch gap or one inch puncture doesn't end up causing millions or thousands of dollars worth of damage. So if we have a puncture over one inch, making sure that we cover it in liquid membrane and overlap with a new sheet and extend six inches on either side, it will completely depend on your system exactly what you're supposed to do. So always follow the manufacturer's installation guidelines and always double check to make sure everybody on the job site is trained. And we're not just talking the foreman. Make sure every single person installing this membrane has gone through training with this specific system because we need to make sure that it's done correctly the first time. So far, we've talked mostly about the vertical waterproofing. So now we're gonna talk about the under slab. So the water protection, vapor protection below the slab, not only do we wanna protect against liquid water, but we also wanna protect our structure against water vapor. We wanna prevent moisture and mildew in those below grade spaces, and we need to protect the flooring and all the people and objects inside as well. So water vapor is also known to debond adhesives, especially if it's a water-based adhesive. If we have any wood flooring, the wood flooring will absorb that moisture and as well cause the floors to buckle. 
So many different reasons why we not only want to protect against liquid water, but also the water vapor. Horizontal soil retention systems, many times we'll see just compacted soil, and that's an acceptable substrate before we put down the waterproofing membrane, gravel, or drainage. But the key factor of the vertical soil retention system is that it has to be smooth and it has to be continuous. You might see a mat slab, mud slab, or clean slab, and there's many different names for it, but they all essentially mean the same thing. Where we put down a sacrificial layer of concrete that doesn't have any reinforcement, it's not meant to be structural. It's just meant to provide a clean, flat, and dry substrate that people can walk on where there's no mud so that we can lay this waterproofing membrane down and be confident that we're not going to have any punctures. We could install the rebar, pour the structural slab, and keep going. But there are some instances where if we have a lot of people walking around on site, we want to make sure that this membrane is as protected as it can possibly be. You might also see a protection slab on the top of the waterproofing membrane, and the protection slab is just a couple inches on top of the membrane. That will protect it from the job site abuse so that we don't have to worry about going in and repairing punctures. You need to know what your risk factor is. So if for an example, let's say that you're building a parking garage where it's not really occupied space, but we still wanna keep the water out, then you might not need all of this because the risk of the puncture is not going to have a huge effect on the rest of the structure. But let's say that this is a basement for a museum and they're gonna be using it for archival space. Then we wanna make sure the entire below grade section is as sealed as it can possibly be. Yeah, it's going to be a little more expensive, but the risk of the waterproofing failing is going to create a lot more damage and expense than on a parking garage situation. So that's kind of how I guide people to decide what level of robustness they would like to, to spend on these types of systems. What is the risk if the waterproofing fails? Are you going to be able to live with the outcome? So all in all, you wanna make sure you follow the manufacturer's instructions. If they're going to recommend a cer certain accessory, then you need to use those accessories and always single source whenever you can, because these membranes come as a system. They're intended to work as a system. And if you use all the accessories from one manufacturer, that's with that one system, you're cutting down on potential compatibility issues. You will be very certain that you're not jeopardizing your warranty in any sort of way. Pre-installation meetings are key. I know it can be a little bit difficult to get everybody in one room, but it's better to talk about these things over a table than sitting on the job site trying to figure out what went wrong. I'm trying to figure out what details need to be reinforced. How are we going to handle the terminations? How are we going to detail the tiebacks? All of these tricky parts that need to be discussed ahead of time with the manufacturer, the installer, the general contractor, and anyone else who potentially will touch this membrane needs to be involved with the pre-installation meeting. I might be a little biased on this one when I say this, but please involve your manufacturer as much as you possibly can. We know these systems well, and we know what works with our products. We know which situations different products will excel in and when you might need a more robust system. So bring us in on all stages of the project and design. We would like to be a part of the pre-installation meetings, and we want to be available for your job site observations to ensure that it's being installed correctly. Please do not hesitate to reach out to your manufacturer as they really would love to be involved. And that concludes our presentation today. I hope you guys enjoyed everything. Um, like I said, this was blindside waterproofing and the best practices for it. And this is my contact information here on the bottom left corner. You can email me at tcarter at wrmeadows.com or reach me on my cell phone, 407-663-4013. Um, like I said, I covered the Southeast region. You can also go on our website at www.wrmeadows.com and reach out to us at info at wrmeadows.com. Um, if you have any, you know, kind of, crazy looking details or anything you need us to kind of attend to, um, you can reach out to me or anybody at our corporate office and we can get that handled too. So I hope you enjoyed and um, thank you for joining me today.